please turn with me again to Mark chapter 15, those passage, those verses that we read from Mark 15. It would be helpful to have those open in front of you as we look this morning, particularly at verses 42 to 47 of, of Mark chapter 15. As you know, in, in our communions over the, the past, uh, well, number of years, we've been making our way through the, the Mark's record of Christ's death. And we come in this communion to the events that are recorded by Mark. And this is the closing passage of, of his gospel from verse 42 in chapter 15 through to verse 8 in chapter 16, which are the last words that, the, that Mark writes in, in this gospel from verse 8 from verse 9 on is, is an ending that has been added by someone who, who isn't Mark. And, and in this passage that we're going to look at over our communion, we're going to see a changed disciple. That's what we're looking at today. We're going to see a certain death. Christ's death was certain. There's no doubt that he died. We're going to see a, a conspicuous difference between Pilate's response to Christ's death and Joseph of Arimathea's response. We're going to see a, a, a compelling direction. Go to, the, go to the disciples. Bring them to me. I'm going to go ahead of them to, to Galilee. And Peter, Peter who had let Jesus down, and yet he's welcomed back to forgiven into Jesus' arms. And we're going to see a climactic discovery. He's risen, the angel said. He's not here. He's alive. So that's, that's our study, an outline of our study over this week and, and next. And today, as I said, in our pre-communion service, we're going to look at a changed disciple, this changed man, Joseph of Arimathea, as he's described in verses 42 to 47. Have you ever been involved in a cover-up? Have you ever tried to keep something secret? Maybe you broke something at home, boys and girls. Your your mom or your, your dad's ornament, something that was on the, on the mantelpiece. And afraid that knowing that your mom or your dad would be cross, afraid of being punished, you try to cover it up. You try to hide it. Or maybe you made a mistake at work. You knew your boss would be furious and again afraid of being found out and punished. You tried to keep it from him or her. You covered it up. Or you have an opinion about something that you know people will react to it in a certain way if, if they knew what you thought. You have a pastime, something you like doing, but you know that how people react will react to it if, if you knew that if they knew that's what you like to do in your spare time. And afraid of people's reaction, you keep quiet. You cover it up. We've all, we've all at some point in our life tried to keep something hidden. Keep something secret. Scared of what will happen if people were to find out. But almost inevitably there comes a time when you can't cover it up any longer. Your mom notices that her ornament has been damaged. And whenever she starts to ask questions and as pressure grows, you have to, to confess. You have to own up. Your mistake at work comes to light. And as the pressure grows, you have to confess. You're asked directly for your view on a particular issue that you've been trying to keep to yourself. And again, you're forced to be open about it. You can't hide it any longer. The time comes when despite the consequences, the embarrassment, maybe even the punishment, you can't keep it hidden anymore. And this morning we're looking at a man, Joseph of Arimathea, who was trying to cover something up. He'd been covering up where he'd been. He'd been covering up who he'd been with. He, he was covering up what he had come to believe. But he comes to the point where he cannot hide it any longer. So despite the consequences, despite the ridicule that he brought upon himself, despite the embarrassment, despite the public shame, despite the punishment of owning Jesus as his Savior and Lord, he comes clean. But as we come to look at this man, the first thing that I want us to see this morning is a covered up confession. A covered up confession. Look at verse 43 of Mark 15. Verse 43, Mark says that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. He was looking for the kingdom of God. 
the, the kingdom that God had promised his Messiah would establish, that his Messiah would enable people to be a part of. Joseph was, was searching. He was looking for that kingdom. He wanted to be right with God. Not only looking for God's kingdom, looking for God's Messiah, he had come to believe that Jesus was, in fact, the promised Messiah, the one through whom people would be forgiven. They would be made right with God. They would be welcomed into God's kingdom. Matthew tells us in, in Matthew 27, and John tells us in, in John chapter 19, that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus, having heard Jesus teach at some point, having witnessed maybe some of Jesus' miracles, uh, having watched from a distance Jesus' life. Joseph had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, God's promised Savior. And in his heart, he confessed, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is Messiah. He became a disciple. But he was an undercover disciple. He covered up his confession. Although in his head he believed that Jesus was God's Savior and through Jesus he could be forgiven, he did it secretly. He hadn't confessed his faith publicly. When others around him were, were laughing at Jesus, ridiculing Jesus, putting Jesus down, plotting Jesus' death, he didn't stand up and say, you know what, well actually I believe Jesus. I believe he is the Messiah. No. Instead, he stood quietly. He was a secret, silent, undercover disciple of Jesus. From John's account, we read something of John's account. From John's account, we know that he must have spoken to Nicodemus about his faith. He maybe told his wife or his family, but he certainly hadn't, hadn't told his work colleagues. He hadn't told his friends at the local synagogue. He was a secret disciple, covered up his confession. Have you ever watched the program Undercover Bosses? I don't think it's on television anymore. It's been off the TV for a while. But it, it was a program where, where bosses of, of huge companies, they, they went to work in disguise. They came to work pretending to be a new employee. So they could fit in with all the other employees on the shop floor or, or in the factory floor or in the office. They could be accepted by, by the other employees while they secretly watched and secretly assessed the company and their employees' performance. They, they went to work undercover, undercover bosses. That's what Joseph was doing. He was a disciple of Jesus, but he went to his work. He went to the synagogue. He met up with his friends in disguise so they wouldn't recognize him as a disciple of Jesus. He was an undercover disciple. Why? It's a question we're asked, we come to ask this morning. Why, would, why did he hide his faith? John tells us in, in John 19, 30, yet he was a secret disciple for fear. For fear of the Jews, he was scared. Why was he scared? Well, firstly, he was, he, he was scared. He feared for his wealth. Matthew 27, Mark doesn't tell us, but it, and Matthew tells us that Joseph was rich. He was a successful businessman. And to declare himself a disciple of Jesus would have meant for him financial disaster. The religious leaders had said that anyone who professed faith in Jesus, anyone who said that Jesus was the Messiah was to be cast out, thrown out of the, of the synagogue. And if you're expelled from the synagogue, essentially you're, you're expelled from the community. You're, you're, you're persona non grata. You're, you're pushed out of the community. And if Joseph had declared himself a disciple of Jesus, he would have been treated the same way that, that our society treats pedophiles or drug dealers. He would have been shunned. He would have been avoided. He would have been made unwelcome. His fellow Jews would have been forbidden from associating with him in any way. And his business would have been ruined. He feared for his wealth. Why else was he scared? Well, he feared for his position. He feared for his position. In verse 43, Mark tells us that he was a, a respected member of the council. 
He was a member of the, the Jewish Sanhedrin. This was a Jewish council, a Jewish authority that overs oversaw the, the running of Jerusalem, the running of, of Israel. He was a bit like an MLA. This was the, our MPs in, in London, they look after the United Kingdom's affairs. But we have our own little Northern Irish council, our, our MLAs in, in Stormont, who look after Northern Irish affairs. Well, Joseph of Ar Arimathea was part of, he was, he was an M MLA in Jerusalem, as it were. He looked after Jewish affairs. And to declare himself a follower of Jesus would have resulted in not only being thrown out of the synagogue, but he would have been thrown out of the council as well. He would be proclaiming himself a follower, a believer, a devotee of the very man the council was trying to destroy. So very quickly, he would have been publicly and humiliatingly dumped from the council. And the reputation that he had spent maybe years cultivating for himself, the social status he had worked hard to achieve, the influence that, that he wielded as a member of the council, the relationships that he nurtured, would all be gone. He feared for his position. But it wasn't only his wealth and his position that he feared losing. He also feared for his life. He feared for his life. As a council member, remember, he would have been present at all those discussions in which the council plotted to take Jesus' life. And no doubt he was thinking to himself, well, if they can do that to Jesus, what's stopping them doing that to me? If they can arrange this man's death, such a public figure in Israel on those particular days, if they can arrange for him to be killed, they could very easily do it to me. He feared for his wealth. He feared for his position. Thirdly, he feared for his life. And those fears led to him to cover up his confession. And here's the application to ourselves today. Are you perhaps living as an undercover disciple of Jesus? Yes, you believe him. You trust him. He's your savior but you're keeping it a secret. You're an undercover disciple. And yes, you tell people here in church, no problem. Very open about your faith here in church. And, and you tell your family, very open about with your family. But when you're talking to your neighbors, when we're talking to our friends, we're talking about things in work, we're a secret disciple. It's a part of your life maybe you don't like to talk about. It's, it's in your heart, yes, but it, it hasn't yet reached your lips. It hasn't reached your Facebook page or your Twitter feed because you're scared. Now, you're maybe not scared about losing your life, but you're scared of openly proclaiming your faith in Jesus. It might affect you financially. You know, your job opportunities might be, might be curtailed by expressing your faith in Christ. Your career prospects, how far, how high up you'll get in your job if you were to, to, to profess to be a Christian. You know, your, your business, how your business would go if, if you were to profess to be a Christian. The amount of money that, that you, you might be think you have, have to, to give to the church. You're scared it'll affect your wallet, your purse, or your bank balance. Or maybe you're scared that by openly declaring your faith in Jesus, you'll lose some of your friends. You'll lose your social status, the reputation that you've spent years cultivating. Maybe you're scared that, that it'll ruin your chances of, of achieving a position that you've set your, your heart on. It might lead to the loss of a position that you currently enjoy. You're scared of being embarrassed in front of your friends. You're, you're scared of being thought of as, as stupid, a fool for, for believing such nonsense by your friends. You're scared of being dumped by your circle of friends if they were to know you're a Christian. You're a disciple, but you're an undercover disciple, a covered up confession. Second thing we see here is a courageous confession, a courageous confession. Look at, at verse 43 this time. Mark says that Joseph took courage. Joseph took courage and he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Jesus. 
He asked for an audience. He asked for an audience with Pilate, the man who had not very long ago condemned Jesus to death. And when he's ushered into Pilate's presence, the presence of, of the most powerful man in the country at the time, in full view of everyone there, loud enough for everyone to hear, Pilate says, can I have Jesus' body? He asked for Jesus' body so he can bury it. And when Pilate grants his request, he and and Nicodemus, as John tells us in John 19, they make their way to Golgotha, where Christ's naked body hangs limp and lifeless on the cross. And in full view of everyone there, it's not nighttime, it's not under cover of darkness, full view of everyone there, they gently lower the cross, they pull the nails from Christ's hands and feet. And carrying Christ's corpse to a nearby garden, helped by by some of the women who had followed Jesus, they tenderly wash the wounds in Christ's chest, the lacerations on his back, the wounds in his hands and his feet, the wounds on his forehead, remember where the, the crown of thorns was pushed down upon his head, the gaping gash, the hole in his side, where the spear had had been thrust in. They wiped away the blood. They wiped away the dirt. They carefully applied spices, balms to Christ's body before wrapping it in new linen and they placed it in a tomb. What's Joseph doing? What's he doing? He's making a very public declaration of his love, his faith in Jesus. By his actions, he's saying to everyone who was watching him, he says, I believe this man. I believe in this man. I trust this man. I love this man. You might have killed him. You might have put him to death. You might have rejected him. You might hate him. I love him. I believe in him. I trust him. The undercover disciple comes out courageously from beneath his blanket of secrecy. The man who up until this point had done everything he could to keep his faith a secret. He cannot keep it secret any longer. And here he openly associates himself with Jesus for all to see. He makes a bold, courageous confession of his faith. That's what he was doing and that's what everyone looking on would have understood that he was doing. To their shock, their amazement, even their disgust, some of the people watching on, this prominent Ruling Jew publicly identifies himself with the crucified Christ. Think of a notorious criminal. We have plenty of them here in our country. Someone who you heard of in in the news, he was convicted of a particularly serious crime. Child murderers of of two-year-old James Bulger. The pedophile and child killer Robert Black an unrepentant loyalist or or Republican killer found guilty of of deaths in our province. Think about how it would go down if you were to publicly associate yourself with someone like that. If you were to publicly associate yourself with someone who had been publicly ridiculed and vilified and you defended that person, you supported that person, how would you be treated? How would it go with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues? That's the vitriol, that's the opposition, that's the hatred, that's the loathing, that's the contempt that Joseph opened himself to by associating himself with Jesus. It was a courageous, a very very courageous confession. Have you done that? That's a challenge today. Have you done that? Have you made the courageous confession of Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Jesus, a person whom the world despises. He's despised. The world has rejected. The world is opposed to him. And they hate and despise. They're opposed to his people. Have you made a public profession of your faith in him? 
And each day, by your words and actions, do you openly associate yourself with Jesus, saying publicly in your words and actions, I believe him, I trust him, I love him, and I don't care who knows. Have you made that courageous confession? Are you making that courageous confession? That's the challenge today. A covered up confession, a courageous confession. Thirdly, and, and finally, it was a costly confession. It was a costly confession. By making this courageous confession, Joseph was, was putting a whole lot on the line. You know, we don't, we don't read anything more about Joseph after this event. We don't know if, he had, if his previous fears, you know, the fears that had kept him a secret disciple, we don't know if those fears were ever fully realized. We don't know for certain if he lost his wealth. We don't know for certain if he lost his position. We don't know for certain if he lost his life. But we do know for certain that all those areas of his life were affected to some degree. He paid a price for confessing Jesus in terms of his wealth, in terms of his position, and in terms of his life. His confession hit his pocket straight away. You know, in the spices, the bands, the new linen shroud that he bought, the tomb that he provided for Jesus' burial. Matthew tells us that this tomb was his tomb. He gave up his new tomb for his Savior. He put his money, he put his property at his Savior's disposal. It cost him financially. It was a costly confession. And his confession affected his position straight away. As soon as he touched Jesus' dead body, he was ceremonially unclean. He couldn't take any further part in the Passover celebrations. His confession didn't just cut him off from the Passover, it cut him off from his people, his community. He would have become an outcast. An outcast. From everything that he was familiar with, everyone, everything that he knew, his whole way of life, He'd associate himself with this blasphemer. And for that, the Jewish leaders said he would be cut off, cast out. Was he thrown out of the synagogue? Almost certainly. Was he thrown off the council? Almost certainly. He would have become a social pariah, a nobody. It was a costly confession. What about his life? Well, in Acts chapter 8, we're told that not very long after these events, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. Christians were imprisoned. Christians were beaten. Christians were persecuted. Christians were killed in Jerusalem. Did Joseph's confession cost him his life? Possibly. Did his confession cost him his way of life? Undoubtedly. No question. It was a costly confession. And when you confess Christ, it will cost you. It will cost you financially as you put your income, your, your resources at, at God's disposal as you ask God what he would have you do with your resources. It may cost you some position. It may cu cut you off from family. It may cut you off from friends who don't understand they're opposed to your way of life. It may cut you off from from a, a whole way of life and, and circle of friends that you were familiar with and comfortable with, as it did for, for Joseph. It may not cost you your life. For us in the West, it doesn't really cost us our lives. For some, it does. But if it doesn't cost you your actual life, it will cost you your way of life. Your life will change dramatically with new directions, new priorities, new objectives. It is a costly confession. So why bother? Why bother? If it costs so much, if it's so hard, why bother becoming a Christian? Why bother believing in Jesus and, and openly confessing him as your Savior and Lord? Why, why did Joseph do it? You know, what, what caused this transformation in, in Joseph's life from a man, remember, who stood silent while Jesus was condemned to death by the council to a man who boldly and, and openly confessed Jesus as his Savior and Lord? What caused the change? Well, as he witnessed events unfold before him, he had a grow, growing realization of who Christ was 
and what was being accomplished through his death. He had a growing realization that this man, Jesus, was the Messiah promised by God, who would accomplish salvation, who would establish God's kingdom through his suffering. As he stood, as, as, he, as Joseph sat on the council and, and he watched Jesus stand silent before him, he saw Je Jesus to be the, the suffering servant who was promised by God through the prophet Isaiah the one who would stand before his accusers and not open his mouth in his defense. In the abuse and debasement that Jesus suffered, Joseph saw him to be the one who God in Scripture said would be despised, rejected by men. Being nailed to the cross, Joseph saw Jesus to be the one who God said in Scripture would be pierced. Pierced for sins, not for his sins, but for ours. Bleeding from countless wounds in his head, in his hands, in his feet, in his chest, in his back, Joseph saw him to be the one who God said, By his wounds you will be healed. Suffering a punishment that he didn't deserve, Joseph saw him to be the one who God said, he would lay the iniquities of all his people upon and the punishment for their iniquity, punishment that would bring them peace. That's what made Joseph make his courageous, costly confession. He came to see with increasing reality and increasing conviction that here on the cross was God's promised saviour, enduring the suffering that was spoken of in the scriptures, God's suffering saviour, suffering the punishment for sin in the place of sinners, so that sinful men and women could have their sins forgiven and be welcomed into the presence of God in heaven. And as these things sank in with greater and greater conviction and clarity, the love he had for Jesus in his heart grew, grew stronger until he could keep it secret no longer. He thought to himself, this man, this man hanging limp and lifeless on the cross, he's not a liar. He's not a blasphemer. He's, he's the saviour whom, whom God promised to send into the world. He's not a criminal. He, he's the innocent, sinless son of God. He didn't deserve to die this way. He could have evaded it easily as God's own son, but he chose to give his life for me. He chose to hang on the cross, to shed his blood for me. He loved me so much, he endured the unrighteous wrath of men and the righteous wrath of God for me. That's what he came to see. And Christ Jesus, having done that without being ashamed of me, how could I be ashamed of him? Having paid so much for me, having paid so high a price for me, how can I refuse to pay the price of confessing him? I believe him. I trust him. I love him. And I don't care who knows. He couldn't keep it a secret any longer. No matter what it costs, the ridicule, the rejection, the embarrassment, the possible loss of his his wealth, his position, his life, he couldn't keep it to himself anymore. The challenge for us, again, are you currently a secret disciple of Jesus? You're covering up your confession? Are you a secret disciple? Well, over the course of of this week and next, over the course of our communion, we're going to be reminded what Jesus endured for his disciples. The death that Jesus died so that you might be forgiven. We're going to handle next Lord's Day the bread and the wine that are symbols of the body and the blood of Jesus. The death that Jesus died so that you might be forgiven. And being reminded over the course of our communion season of the death 
that Jesus died for you as a professed disciple? How can you remain a secret disciple? How can you still live in front of your family and friends as if Jesus doesn't mean anything to you? And seeing again what Jesus endured for us, may we, like Joseph, be moved to declare courageously before our family members, before our friends, before our work colleagues, before our neighbours, before anyone who will listen, we'll tell them, Jesus, yeah, I know him. I trust him. I believe him. I love him. And I don't care. Who knows? C.T. Studd, uh, I read this quote on Facebook this week. C.T. Studd was, was an, interna an England international cricketer, famous cricketer. He was very wealthy. He had his whole life ahead of him. He was going to be world famous. He was going to be an international sportsman with all the, the prestige and the money and the wealth and the, the position uh, that that would have offered to him. And yet he gave it all up to become a missionary, I think, to China, somewhere in Asia. Gave it all up. And when asked why he did, this is what he said. If Jesus Christ be God, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, and he did, he did, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. How can we be secret disciples? How can we be secret disciples in the light of such a God and such salvation? Amen.